All right, part B, lecture 22. Let's look at the banking bubble and panic of 1819. Well, the Bank of the United States, the first bank in the United States, expired in 1811, but then war broke, broke out between the U.S. and Great Britain in 1812. We talked about that in part A of the last video. The government turns to the state banks for borrowing because there's no longer a federal bank. Doesn't go so well. The state banks have to suspend specie redemption. It's a bit of a mess. The financial system feels a bit chaotic. And so in 1816, a second bank of the United States is established, or rather a new bank of the United States is established. There's only one, but it's the second version of this bank. Monopoly charter, fractional reserves, branches in all the states of the union. The U.S. Treasury can deposit, will, will deposit funds in this institution. All the rest, there's the banknote and the state banks which still issue notes, more notes than ever, actually, return to specie redemption in February of 1817. Well, the banking bubble continued. Look at that. Boy, if we thought that was a big jump between 1811 and 1814, look at this jump. By 1818, there are 338 state banks. So, yes, there's a central bank of sorts, the second bank of the U.S., but there's a whole lot of state banks all issuing banknotes backed by fractional reserves. And so there's more currency and more credit than ever. And you could say, well, it's justified. There's a market revolution going on. True, there is. But... Is there enough coin? Is there, are there enough hard assets to back it up? Is it real, in other words? Is it real? Is it based on something tangible, right? Or is it a paper boom? Just made up, made up credit, not founded on anything substantial. Well, we'll see. State, the state banks and the, and the Bank of the United States, like I said, they resume specie payments. So it seems, yeah, it is, well, it is backed by something real. It, these notes are convertible, redeemable, on demand. Anytime you could go to the bank counter, I could bring this note, present the note at the counter of the Citizens Bank in Louisiana and get $5 of coin. I can go to the Bank of Augusta, print the, uh, present this note and receive a silver dollar. I can go to the Atlantic Bank, present that $5 note, and the bank clerk will give me five U.S. silver dollars. So, seems like it's real, but here's the catch. It's a lower reserve ratio than previously. Okay, Before the War of 1812, uh, reserve ratios were about 30-40%. Now they're down to 10-15% meaning there's much, many more demand obligations out there, banknotes and demand deposits, than there is coin in the vault. You're pyramiding off of a lower base of reserves. And so look at that jump in the money supply. Woo, that's a big jump. 60% increase in the money supply. And that's... Most of that difference is our banknotes. It's not an increase in coin, increase in banknotes. 60% increase between 1816 and 1818. And the bulk, or much of this increase, is because of the Second Bank of the United States. And in fact, the Second Bank of the United States was not as conservative this time around as its uh, forebear. The Bank of the U U.S. had... Um, roughly a reserve ratio of roughly 11% during this period. That's a very quite low ratio of coin in the vault to, to, uh, to notes and demand deposits. But for now, it seems to be going great. Everything is, is uh, swimming along. Prices during this period, 1816, 1817 through 1818, they're going up, up, up. That includes agricultural goods, real estate, all of it. Uh, in increased investment 
Um, in fact, actually, this period saw witness the birth of investment banking in the United States. Investment banking, wheeling and dealing in different securities. In 1817, the New York Stock Exchange was founded. Ah, oh, the New York Stock Exchange. And so you could deal in shares and buy buy shares in companies and sell shares in companies. And look at that. Wow, that's quite an impressive increase in, in the value of, of U.S. exports. $81 million worth of exports in 1815. And by 1818, it jumped by 43%. But here's the other thing, too. Creation of asset bubbles. Asset bubbles. Now, what is an asset bubble? Well, when there's a whole lot of new paper money and credit injected into the system, there's a tendency for that new credit to channel into particular trending assets where there's, there's a lot of hype behind a particular asset, right? In the late 1990s or mid to late 1990s, there was a dot-com bubble, right? You had fairly cheap credit coming out of the Federal Reserve under Alan Greenspan, and there was a lot of hype behind dot-com companies and the prices. A lot of that cheap credit went went into those companies. The stock prices went through the roof. And then, well, didn't end so well. Uh, and in the 2000s, also under Alan Greenspan and later uh, Ben Bernanke as Fed chairman, cheap credit, very low interest rates. And what was the asset bubble? Real estate, housing, mortgages. And, and the prices went up, 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 and, uh, and there was a lot of hype behind them, right? So there's a tendency for these asset bubbles to be created, and, and it can find, this new credit can find its way into different avenues. For example, during this period, between 1816 and 1818, um, real estate prices went up a lot. Um, road and canal construction companies, you know, different road companies, canal companies, they required a lot of capital, a lot of investment, and, and now that credit's easy, credit's cheaper, well, maybe, uh, maybe our canal company, which requires a lot of borrowing, will, has a greater chance of success. And so you see a boom in that. Slave markets, slave markets. Of course, uh, slaves were considered commodities in the South. And, and like any commodity, they had a price. And so you had speculators using a lot of this new cheap credit and paper money to invest in the slave trade or in buying and selling slaves and making profit off of it or uh, accepting slaves as collateral on loans. And so slave markets too see a big boom during this period. But the number one asset bubble of all during this period and through much of the 19th century were Western land sales, Western land sales. All this land out west, okay? And not just west of the Mississippi, although that recently has been opened up, but in Ohio country and in Indiana and in Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, all this land down here, Alabama, Mississippi. This is in 1818, this is yet to be completely settled. Now the federal government was in charge of selling this land and the government sold land at one dollar an acre one dollar an acre speculators figured that that's a fairly low price and began buying up that land at one dollar an acre and then turning around and selling it on the private market at a higher price or holding on to it for a period waiting it out for a couple years and then selling it that's what speculation is about. You're speculating that the price of whatever asset you're dealing in is going to rise between the time you bought it and between the time you sold it. And the federal government in 1815 sold $3 million of land out west. It, by 1818, it was selling over $13 million of land. That's an increase of 450% between those three years. And what are they accepting as payment? The federal government's accepting Bank of the United States notes and accepting these state bank notes. Okay, 
So the federal government says, look, if these notes are redeemable on demand in gold and silver coin, which they all were by 1818, then we will accept that as payment for land sales and, and that's that. So you have all this cheap credit, lower reserve ratios, and the federal government agreeing to take these notes at par for land sales. Well, as it so happened, a panic, a panic. Now, signs that something was off was already appearing by by late summer of 1818. And actually, the Bank of the United States began slowly contracting its loans and its balance sheet beginning in the second half of 1818 into early 1819. But by 1819, it's clear that this whole system, it's a house of cards and, and there's not enough real things to back it and pretty rapidly uh, run on a banks nationwide, but especially in the South and in the West, where banks were a bit more reckless in their paper money issues. And the banks, predictably, suspended specie payments, said, nope, all right, we're going to remain in operation, but we can no longer redeem our notes for silver and gold. So a suspension of specie payments, the whole system came crashing crashing down look at the public land sales went from 13.6 million in 1818 and crashed down to only 1.7 million in 1820 lower than even what it was in 1815 so public land sales crashed what does that mean that means if you had speculated in public land back in in these glory days in the boom time you were stuck now with land that you had no intention of of settling most of these speculators had didn't even visit the property they just bought the land they were absentee speculators never visited it just planned it on on turning it around they're stuck with this land and they can't dump it on anybody nobody there are no buyers and so buyers disappear and uh, a lot of speculators lost a lot of money during this during this crash but just wasn't in public land sales that too um, but um, even with the suspension of specie payments, so the banks get a bit of a bailout here. They can they can suspend paying their debts, but even then, you had banks go go under. There was a, a decline in the number of banks from 341 to 267, and the reason why you still had some banks go under despite suspending payments was uh, the banks had on their balance sheet they invested in all these different properties and stocks and and. Uh, and Western land sales and all, all these different assets that ended up nosediving, taking a nosedive. And so even with the suspension of specie payments, many of them couldn't survive and went under. Look at that, the money supply. Money supply fell by 28% between in that, in that year time from a peak of 103 million to 74 million as banks either go under completely or uh, rapidly withdraw their notes from circulation. Um, by the way, uh, just as a note, if you had money deposited in one of these banks that went under, one of the banks that went under, you lost what you lost everything. You lost what you had deposited. Um, there was no deposit insurance in those days, and so you know when we say seventy some odd banks failed, right? That, uh, Let's not gloss over that number. That 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 ruined hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Um, lost their the money they had deposited in that bank from from that closure. Um, the Bank of the United States drastically curtailed its its credit and demand obligations. They had twenty two million dollars worth of banknotes and demand deposits in eighteen eighteen. By 1819, they were down to half that number. So this is a severe contraction in the money supply. And by consequence, deflation. Prices fell by 88%, 88% between the end of 1818 and summer of 1819. That's a drastic fall in prices. Um, bankruptcies resulted. <clears throat> businesses that had been founded if you're an entrepreneur even if you had a good business sorry uh done um 
people, uh, the property foreclosed on, let's say you were a farmer and you had contracted some debt, but now the prices of your crops have taken a nosedive. Um, you're unable to make any of your mortgage payments, um, your property is uh, foreclosure. In some states there was a moratorium, but not in all states. And and, uh, uh, and if you were a debtor and, and you could not have access to the money to repay your debt, um, in many of these places you you were you faced financial ruin and then unemployment in the cities just business went went down um, unemployment uh, just a, a bad situation all around this is what we call the boom bust cycle the boom bust cycle we've already looked at this a bit with the um, tulip mania and the South Sea bubble but boom bust cycle uh, uh, the boom is a period in which you have uh, cheap credit cheap credit. And I have a qualifier there, uh, um, artificially cheap credit. Now, what does that mean, artificially cheap credit? Well, um, if you have cheaper credit because um, in this day, in the, in the day, in the age of uh, commodity money, if, if credit is cheaper because, well, all of a sudden the country is producing more and and uh, and um, it has a, a trade balance that's bringing more silver and gold into a country and that this is naturally made capital more plentiful and uh and because there's more money more hard money more coin now in the country well that means there's more loanable funds which will decrease the interest rate and allow for more credit that's more of a natural sort of a, a response of the interest rate to just a very productive economy that's a little different what we have here is artificially cheap credit because you saw a huge expansion in the currency supply, a huge expansion in the credit system through much of the 1810s, but not a real increase in the uh, coin to back it up. And, and so this was an, a, an artificially cheap credit system. And it fueled the boom, fueled the boom into all these different assets, creating bubbles. Um, this artificially cheap credit system leads to malinvestment. Bad decisions are made. You know, those canal companies, they, they see, oh, wow, the interest is really low, and, um, and now's the time to, to start up this company. And, and it sends the wrong signal. You remember in way, way, way back, early lecture, we talked about price signals and the importance of price signals. Price signals communicate knowledge and information to consumers and producers. Well, the interest rate is a price signal. It, it communicates something. And, and if you end up sending an artificial signal that, seem, that seems to suggest that, that there is this great you know, volume of loanable funds and this very productive economy, but, it, but it's not actually real. It's, it's fueled just by paper and, and, and by uh, just made up assets you're encouraging people to invest where they otherwise probably shouldn't invest. And this is called malinvestment. What follows is the bust, and that's the correction, where, where the reality sinks in and, and, uh, and people wake up to, the, to, to what had happened, and, uh, and you have, can have a pretty severe, severe correction, as we saw in 1819. This is a cartoon, I love this cartoon, it's one of my favorites. From the 19th century. This, now this comes from a later panic. There was a panic in 1837. We'll look at that in a future lecture. Next week probably. But nonetheless it's the same idea. Boom bust cycle. Here's the boom. If you can see my mouse. There's the boom. And you see the guy was he having his hand. Oh he has a great big bottle of liquor. And he's just having a great old jolly time. And ooh, yeah. Partying it up. And loving it man. Just loving it. Loving it. Loving it. And um, well, what happens when we drink? Well, you know, I enjoy a good drink every now and then, certainly. And, uh, you know, you have your first drink and you're feeling great. You're feeling a little loose and, uh, you know, all right. I feel con you're a little more confident maybe even. And, uh, well, then you have your second drink. And then you have your third drink. And maybe a fourth drink. Oh, my. And all of a sudden, what's happening? You are acting brashly. Uh, you are maybe talking some nonsense. Um, you're making stupid decisions, okay? You're not acting soberly. You're acting irrationally. But you're in this sort of 
ecstasy. This is uh, uh, you fooled yourself into thinking that, well, this is the right thing to do, and 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 you know, I'm not. You know, you almost get you get wrapped up into it. You're having a good time. You know, you're having a good time. Don't don't you know. Uh, don't ruin my time, man. I'm having, I'm enjoying myself, and and that's the boom. That's the boom, and and it leads to just bad behavior. The analogy during the boom, what's the liquor? What is the liquor? The liquor is that cheap credit. That cheap credit's the liquor, and the cheap credit is getting everybody all liquored up, and that's what creates the malinvestment, the poor decisions, right? The next day, you wake up. Oh, man. And just splitting headache. Major hangover. Uh, man. Whew. Uh, and then you start remembering, oh, my gosh. Just wait. What did I do? And you look at your phone and you read your text. Oh, man. Did I you realize you texted so-and-so at 1 a.m. in the morning? And I can't believe I, I did this. Oh, man. I'm going to have to talk to this person. And... And what I did, what and 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 you start and and you're just you feel like complete garbage, right? And it's worse the more you drink, right? It's worse the more you drink. You just have a beer or two, you're probably fine. You're not going to do that bad. But oh, you 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 went overboard the night before. You're going to feel really really bad. Um, that's the correction. That's the correction. The realization of what had happened. So when you analyze the boom-bust cycle, it's real easy to look at this guy, if you look at my mouse, the, the drunk, having a good time. It's real easy to look at him and blame him. you know. And, and in a sense, perhaps. But the real question to ask when analyzing the boom-bust cycle and trying to assign blame, who provided the liquor? Who provided the liquor? That's the big question. And, and people asked that question in 1819, and they concluded the Bank of the United States. It was the Bank of the United States that encouraged this recklessness, that encouraged the state banks to do this, and who did it themselves. And, and, all, and all of a sudden, in 1819, the Second Bank of the United States went from being a fairly you know, popular institution, or at least people didn't have much problem with it, to becoming a, a, a hated institution among many people um, among a broad portion of the public. There was a, and all fractional reserve banks actually suffered, um, became targets of this public resentment, but especially the Bank of the United States. That was the big daddy. And there was the, a saying in those days, the bank was saved, but the people were ruined. The bank was saved and people were ruined. What's that about? Well, you guys, you, the banks, they could suspend specie payments. They could say, oh, oh, all of a sudden, you know, we can't pay these debts. Sorry, we'll have to suspend specie payments. But ordinary Americans, you can't just say that. You can't just do that. Um, if you can't pay your debts, then you're, you're foreclosed on or you lose your job. And, and, and so there was a sense here of a deep unfairness. Wait a second. And this is where the realization sets in among many people. Oh, man, Jefferson was right. Jefferson was right. He warned us of all of this. And, and he turned out to be prophetic. Look at what we have now. A, a, a system where, where the economy has been wrecked and, and, and the few have escaped and the many have been ruined. So, in 1819, shortly after a crash... The Maryland legislature decided to pass a bill that taxed the Bank of the United States branch at Baltimore. So the Bank of the United States has branches all across the Union. They happen to have one in Baltimore. The Maryland legislature, in retaliation for this panic, decided to levy a tax on the Bank of the United States branch. Now, the funny thing about this, the legislature already taxed state banks state charter banks already already had the tax levied on them the only bank that wasn't taxed was the bank of the united states branch of baltimore because it was a federal federally chartered bank well the legislature says you know what too bad we're taxing you the bank of the united states at baltimore the branch head said nope well, we don't recognize this as legitimate and refuse to pay the tax the uh, representative of the of the uh, tr treasurer in maryland 
busted and forcibly opened his way into the bank and with armed guards busted into the vault confiscated the the tax took the money that that the merit state of maryland said was owed to them and and left a building <laughs> and so the bank of the united states sued and they were represented by one of uh, the representative here was mcculloch sued the state of maryland for this tax and for taking the money it went to the supreme court and what became one of the early big decisions of the supreme court and it was a big decision written up by the chief justice john marshall now john marshall was an old federalist he was nominated to the bench at the end of john adams administration john adams was a federalist and like hamilton and other federalists john marshall had interpret had an interpretation of the constitution that that looked at the text of the constitution and and interpreted it quite broadly and allowed for flexibility and and believed in a a fairly powerful federal government as opposed to the stricter more narrow um, uh, uh, narrower uh, view textualist view we would call it of of the uh, constitution john marshall took this took this case and the first part of his decision he said okay let me settle something once and for all okay the bank of the united states is constitutional constitutional hamilton was right article one says that congress has the power to to do what is necessary and proper to carry out the foregoing powers and in the bank of the united states is necessary and proper it's constitutional so that's a big this is the first time the court has spoken on this issue but second mcculloch also said states may not impede the operations of the federal government meaning you don't have any authority to tax this branch because if you do then that means that the state governments will become more powerful than the federal government and that's the precise uh reverse opposite of of what should be he said the power to tax is the power to destroy and so states have the power to tax federally chartered institutions then then that um uh then that essentially places the states ahead of a federal government it's a very controversial decision still is there are people who would disagree with this decision and um uh, but it's a big one in expanding broadening the powers of the federal government well like i said there was a spike in anti-banking anti-fractional reserve banking the anti-banking united states sentiment however interestingly by 1821 1822 the economy actually recovered so it was a brief very very severe but brief contraction and depression a total disaster for about a year and a half two years but the country was out of it by the end of 1822 and with that actually criticism of the second bank of the united states went away for the most part and by the so that by the mid 1820s nobody is really talking about getting rid of the second bank of the united states um and and so this was a, a fairly momentary flare-up however as we'll see uh next lecture there will be a president a new president elected in 1828 a man by the name of andrew jackson and Andrew Jackson takes it upon himself to wage a war against that second bank, the United States. It's known as the Bank War. And we'll talk about that next time for lecture 23. See you there.